Yeah, and so I think going in right there, right away, you know, he mentioned with – we'll start with the SEC, I think. He mentioned a team like Florida, right? You know, the roster is still loaded with five-star talent, right? And the defense, right, the, the, the defense, you know, output, is it going to match the talent that's there? What are you guys' take on Florida, you know, as a team going into, going into this year? The thing I want to see that he really talked about was, you know, you have Kyle Trask at quarterback last year. Now you have Emory Jones, and it's a completely different system. Like, how smooth is that tra- you know transition to that run heavy as a quarterback kind of offense? That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, they have a lot of guys coming in, but can Dan Mullen you know catch up the offense quick enough to get things rolling? Because as you know, in the SEC it starts week one, and you have to hit the ground running. You can't make any mistakes. So I want to see what Emory Jones does to take that next leap. We'll talk about a lot of quarterbacks in the SEC and Big 12 that need to take that next step up. And Emory Jones is definitely one of them. And if he does, they can do a lot of damage. If if you look at the track records of Alabama, the quarterbacks they lose to in the past, it's quarterbacks that can run, that can fake you out, and do a lot with their offense. Yeah, Emory Jones is a guy that I'm not 100% sold on. There's some people, you know, PFF and other people out there predicting him to be a first-round draft pick next year. How about, <laughs> let, how about let's see a guy – you know, control an entire game. There's been moments where Emory Jones has come in and looked great. There's also been moments where he's come in and Dan Mullen has put on his Gus Malzahn hat and tried to run a a crazy trick play and really put Emory Jones in a bad situation. So to be fair to Emory Jones, we really need to see him in a full game setting and see him be able to control this offense. But if they think that he's going to come in and throw with the, the accuracy and the ability to, you know, anticipate throws and things like that that Kyle Trask was doing last year, then Florida fans are, you know, fooling themselves on that one. Plus, also, I don't think that people realize, and I think they will this year when they see the output of Kyle Pitts and Kadarius Toney in the NFL, because I think both of those guys are going to be great in the NFL, great, uh, great prospects, you know, heading into the National Football League. And when you lose that much production, as Brett said, Kyle Pitts finished in the top 10 in Heisman voting as a tight end. That just doesn't happen, guys. So uh, Florida is still a lot to prove. But speaking of that, let's throw this graphic up on the screen real quick. This is something that we came up with all together, uh, kind of the tiers here of the college football landscape in the SEC. Donovan, uh, kind of break those down for everybody, you know, as we went through our thought process. Yeah, going through, we'll start at the bottom. I mean, tier four, I mean, yikes, is pretty self-explanatory. They're the bottom feeders, right? Vanderbilt and South Carolina, there's not a lot of potential from them, right? Tier three is a prove me wrong tier. And I think, you know, maybe we disagree with some of those, but those are some of the teams that, you know, maybe there's some hype going with them. Maybe there's not, but, you know, it's time for them to prove us, prove me wrong, right, in terms of their potential for the season. Uh, tier two, you know, there's some exciting teams there, but, you know, it's more the enjoy your bowl game tier, right? Enjoy the, the December 29th bowl game that, you know, is clustered in between four others, right? And then, of course, tier one is the kingpins, right? The playoff contenders and the ones who really have the best chance uh, or guarantee chance to run the SEC. Yeah, and I had Brett focus on, and I'll throw it up one more time here for the people on YouTube, I had Brett kind of focus on that tier two, the enjoy your bowl game type tier to see who could be the challengers, because I knew that we were going to talk a lot about the kingpins, about the guys up top, right? And I think that the most intriguing thing for me is Georgia has more depth and more talent than they've ever had at the, at you know, including the quarterback piece now under Kirby Smart and maybe maybe in me- recent memory. So there's absolutely no excuses for Georgia at this point. And I think that's why Brett picked them to be not only the SEC champion eventually, but he picked them to be number two going into the college football playoff. For people that don't know, by the way, if you haven't seen the season preview on Pick 6 Previews, I highly recommend it. It's a great $18 that you're going to spend to get that preview. He predicts Oklahoma – as one, Georgia is two, uh, Ohio State three, and North Carolina four. But Josh, mm. uh, you're a resident Alabama guy here, so uh, that one you, hurts. Do you take <laughs> umbrage with what Brett said about your Crimson Tide? You know, I just I, I go back and I think about all the the great Georgia Alabama matchups, and I just don't see it happening. You know, I, I agree with you. Y'all have the depth and everything, and like you said, Alabama's always reloading. Like, can they produce right away? 
and it happens every year. Like I hate to say it, but it happens every single year. And it, ha- it helps when we have this kind of defense coming back. I'd say the best defense in college football, top to bottom, especially as a whole unit. You look at the linebacker core, like I talked about last week, loaded. Then you add one of the best transfers you can get out there from uh, Tennessee, Henry Toto. They have him as a uh, captain calling plays on defense now. And then you have that secondary. It's just – I'm excited to see that matchup. But I kind of want to swing it out. I want to talk about Texas A&M because we have them as a tier two, but I think they can be that sneaky team that is that tier one. I'm not going to lie. They make me nervous. You know, you talk about Jimbo Fisher and how he's doing his recruiting and everything. He's confident. We hear it all the time. But I think Texas A&M does need some respect. Now, of course, like you said, the big question is, can Haynes King come in right away to the gauntlet and handle it? Or does he, you know, kind of falter and then it's up to Zach? I don't know. Haynes, he had he played a few steps last year. It wasn't much, though. But Isaiah Spiller, when you have a rushing attack like that, over 1,000 yards last year coming back, then you have one of the top tight ends with Jalen uh, Weidermeyer coming in, too. I feel like that really helps your quarterback. You have these reliable weapons. So I want to see if they can really reload. Now I want to talk about the recruiting-wise. Blaine, do you think they have enough guys coming in this year to really excel them to that kingpin status or no? Well, with Texas A&M, they've really been trying to, uh, you know, trying to turn the corner on the on the recruiting output, and and they're they're getting close to being up there now in the perennially, you know, in that in that upper tier. When and when you're in the upper tier in the SEC, that puts you firmly inside the top ten in the country in recruiting. Right. In fact, I uh, for another show I had recently, I can throw this up there. I had recruiting trends. And you can see right now on the rivals rankings, A&M is currently in this recruiting class, the 2022 class, ranked 10th. Alabama ninth. Uh, Georgia is was up at six. That was before Jake Pope committed to Alabama, a safety from Georgia. But in terms of this recruiting class, I think that Texas A&M did what they needed to do by keeping a lot of homegrown talent there. But the the main thing with Texas A&M is they quite possibly have the two best running backs in the country when you're talking about Spiller and Anaya Smith. And I think one of the bigger matchup problems for Alabama is going to be if Jimbo Fisher is able to find a way to go split back, you know, gun, he likes to do a lot of two back sets, uh, even like some some Drew Brees, New Orleans Saints, Sean Payton type, type stuff there. And they have a player in Anaya Smith that is different. I mean, DJ Shockley talked about him last week in our in our debut episode. Anaya Smith is a guy that, let's say they start him off in the backfield. Well, now Henry Toto is in the box covering him, right? And one weakness of Henry Toto is that he is not a great coverage linebacker. Georgia exposed him last year in that with, with James Cook, with Kenny McIntosh. So Anaya Smith gets motioned out. Now he's in the slot. Who covers him? Things like that. So it's going to be matchups like that that are intriguing. But, you know, Donovan – uh, a lot of you're our resident offensive lineman here. So one program I wanted to talk to you about, and you, and I'll throw the tears back up here. You originally had them down here in the prove me wrong. I said, nah, I got to slide them up here to enjoy the bowl. And the reason is Kentucky has, you know, three guys that could end up being, uh, you know, all American caliber type linemen with that experience. And then a, a quarterback in Will Levis coming in, you know, when, when you have the experienced offensive line up there, you just talk about it. What's that synergy like when you've been playing with guys for a long time? Yeah, you get into sync, right? And with Will Levis having that, you know, dual threat ability, like we saw a little bit in, you know, in, in, in flashes at Penn State, when you have that not just, you know, experience at Kentucky's offensive line, but that potential, right, mix with that experience, you can have good things going on. And I, I could see Kentucky stink, you know, getting into that bowl game at, you know, seven and five, you know, maybe eight and four if they're lucky, maybe. Um, and so that offensive line is big. And speaking of offensive line, I think one thing you guys are talking about, Texas AM, what doesn't help, you know, an 18, 19 year old new starting quarterback or, you know, an all worldly duo at running back is the fact that four of their five starters on the offensive line are gone. And basically five of them are gone because I believe the tackle is going into guard. I, I, I'm blanking on his name. But you're basically losing five starters on the offensive line, and so uh, the the difference I think with Kentucky, right? Where you talk about the experience and talent um, and the potential mixed together, it could push them up into that second tier. Yeah, and and we're gonna wrap our playoff talk on the SEC and move to the Big Twelve here, still in our playoff segment. But guys, 
I think the most intriguing thing, and Josh, you said it, is that SEC West is an absolute gauntlet. And yeah. Brett told everybody that don't sleep on LSU this year. That was a that was you know COVID, all that kind of stuff that was going on in 2020 that that had the season out of sorts, uh, coordinator changes, all that. LSU seems to have remedied that in this offseason. I think Max Johnson is going to be an excellent so quarterback for them. Really showed some some poise and some toughness in that Florida game late in the year last year in his first uh, first start over there. So. You know, look look out for LSU. Like I said, A&M is there. Alabama always there, the standard. But, you know, with Alabama losing as much talent as they ever have in the Saban area off that last year's team, uh, three Heisman Trophy candidates, really, uh, that's just a lot to, to replace, and it shows you how good that Alabama program is. But now let's go ahead and talk about – and I think we firmly established there that it, it seems like Georgia and Alabama – are the two that were really fighting for playoff spots. And if chaos breaks out, then Georgia and Alabama could potentially both find their way in there, providing a one loss situation, but it would have to take a lot of chaos uh, out there on the other four because the rest of the country just absolutely hates the SEC <laughs> with passion. And that is why we are headed towards playoff expansion. But that's a talk for maybe next week. Who knows? What's it going to look like when Texas and Oklahoma joins? It's going to be like an all, uh, all SEC playoff at that point if they don't expand it. Absolutely. So now let's talk about the Big 12. So here are our tiers for the Big 12. And as Brett said, he's got Oklahoma, Iowa State, 1-2. We agree with that. Um, the guys in the middle there, Texas is trying to find relevancy. The only reason I put them up here, Donovan, is because I believe, like Brett Ciancia said, that much in Steve Sarkeesian and his ability to scheme things up. Uh, just from, you know, former offensive lineman and, and, you know, playing college football, how impressed are you with Steve Sarkeesian's ability just to, to, to formation people, motion people out of plays at times? Yeah, I mean, it's impressive, right? And when you can create that kind of, you know, the mismatches, even if you don't have some, sometimes the better personnel, is, you know, compared to the defense you're playing, the mismatch and the confusion uh, – it creates an ability, especially with the offensive line. A lot of people think a complicated offense, right, means it's complicated to learn for everybody, especially for the offensive line. It's not as complicated as you think, right? It's still their basic zone plays. You know, the the crazy looking RPO to an offensive lineman, it's it's still the same thing it always been, right? It's it's in the backfield, it's on the edge that it changes, and so I'm confident in him, right? And I I, I agree with your your tier two ranking of Texas. Um, again, not to say a whole lot about the the Big Twelve. Um, I'm not a you know big proponent of them but you know i i see them you know in that tier two and you know oklahoma and iowa state are obviously the kingpins but you know in that tier two it's it's kind of a toss-up who could lead that you know second tier and and the reason that west virginia drops down in that prove me wrong type category they just lost so much uh you know half of their defensive the defensive backs uh, seemed to transfer out and you know it, it was it's a tough tough deal for west virginia right now but he talked about Max Duggan at TCU. Josh, uh, you know, anytime you have a guy who is as good of an athlete as Max Duggan, maybe the fastest guy on their team at the quarterback position, and he's in his third year as a starter, that just totally changes the dynamic of your team and the confidence they have. I mean, is, it, is that kind of the feeling you get with TCU and Gary Patterson? Yeah, with TCU, it's not really ever been about offense. So having that experience, quarterback coming back, like you said, that athletic ability. But if you look at the draft, you know, they're pushing out defensive guys like Brett was talking about, that secondary uh, with Washington and, and Moorg last year. They're reloading. They're just keep pushing more guys out. They had to transfer from Memphis. I believe his name was TJ Carter, one of their leading tacklers last, last season. Um, and then they also have uh, Hodges – Thomas and then Noah Daniels in the secondary. So it helps when you have a good defense. You know, we talk about with Washington, you know, how bad our offense has been, but our defense always bails us out. When you have a defense like that, you can rely on. It takes a lot of stress off of the quarterback. So having him with the experience, with athletic ability he has, and then you have a good defense really backing him up, that can create turnovers and get the ball back and give him more opportunities if he does make a mistake. That's huge. I love Gary Patterson as a head coach, by the way. I, I like what they're doing. And it helps the Big 12's defense is kind of iffy. So having one of the big, you know, best defenses in the Big 12 certainly helps you out at TCU. So I think we're all in the agreement that really the, the teams to to watch here, if we want to say 
uh, the top three in each conference. We're talking it's it's a it's Alabama, Georgia, A and M. It looks like in SEC. It looks like Oklahoma, Iowa State, and TCU with an outside shot in the Big Twelve. Let's go ahead and put on record here to end up our playoff spot, uh, our playoff segment. Everybody, go ahead and pick your conference champions, and just go ahead and say it. We don't have to do a whole lot of explanation because we got other segments here. But let's go ahead and say uh, who's going to be the champion in each conference. Who you got? Yeah, yeah, I'll lead it off. Uh- I, I think I'm going to flip from last week. I'm going to go Georgia as the SEC champion. Uh, mm. Sorry to all the Alabama fans and sorry to Josh. Uh, and then Big 12, uh, I'm going to stick with Oklahoma for now, right? I, Iowa State's teetering on the edge, but I'm going to stick with Oklahoma for now. Josh? I, I'm going to stay true to my colors. I'm going to say Alabama. I think that defense, you know, takes that step with all these young guys coming in. We've seen how they've been in the past. I see a resemblance of these, you know, 2010, 2012 teams on defense. And I'm going, I'm riding this hype train hard with Iowa State. Brees Hall rushed over 1,500 yards last year. They have one of the best quarterbacks coming back, one of the most experienced teams in college football. You don't see that happen. One of the best offensive lines. I can go on and on about this team. They have everything. This is their window of opportunity, and I just don't see Matt Campbell not passing up on that. So Iowa State beats Oklahoma like they did last year. Yeah, Oklahoma and Georgia seem very similar to me as they always find a a way to lose games that they shouldn't, it seems like. So I agree with you. I think Iowa State will match up with Oklahoma twice. I think they beat them at least once. Uh, And I think that's going to be in the – it probably in the conference championship game because I I think Matt Campbell and then that kind of sticks with them, that loss from last year. 20 of 22 starters from last year return. I'm going Iowa State in the Big 12. And then in terms of the SEC, uh, I say until they're proven otherwise, Alabama's the Kings, and you're going to not be able to knock off Alabama until somebody does it. Kirby Smart's yet to do it. I think Georgia and JT Daniels have a lot to prove in order to, to do this. We'll find out a lot about Georgia on September 4th. They do have injuries to Darnell Washington and Tyke Smith. Yet, like I said, Georgia, I, I think from a talent standpoint, having had – three rivals, number one ranked classes consecutively in 2018, 2019, 2020, and then the number five class in 2021. Georgia has more talent and more depth accumulated than anybody. However, can they get over that mental hump against Alabama? I'm going to say until proven otherwise, no, and Alabama is the SEC champions. But uh, now now let's go ahead and get in to our Heisman talk. 